Hello and welcome. Uh, let's see if um, we can just give it a few seconds to uh, see if we get some people coming in and joining us. Don't want them to miss the very top of this broadcast. Um, so I'll just give it a, a, another 10, 20 seconds and then, um, and then we'll get started. All the last minute things you have to do before you go on air, make sure you've got a, a pen and a paper, and we, we, we will be ready to go in just a moment. Okay, let's uh, let's get started, shall we? Because uh, we're meant to start at three o'clock uh, UK time. It's, it's one minute past three, so I, I'm already late, but I just thought I'd let uh, make sure people are gonna join uh, in time. So welcome to a very special broadcast. Uh, this is on YouTube, and it's also on Facebook. And it's by Orchard, the OCD charity. Um, uh, we are being hosted by Made of Millions, so thank you very much to them. I'm Sean Fletcher, I'm a broadcaster in the UK on the BBC and ITV, anyone will have me really, um, but I am absolutely honored to be doing this broadcast. It's extremely topical uh, for the times. It's uh, We're gonna be looking at treating OCD in the time of COVID. It's no surprise that we hear uh, stories of people with OCD who are struggling particularly at this time. Um, COVID, the attempts to prevent the spread of COVID, lockdown restrictions, uh, the increased fear, they're all very valid things in stopping COVID and preventing the spread of it, but they don't help on the whole with OCD and particularly people who have uh, contamination OCD. So we're gonna be looking at, at that. Now, um, uh, we're gonna split this into two sections. Uh, I'm gonna stop talking in, in just a moment. I'm gonna uh, definitely stop waffling. Um, the first section is gonna be, uh, well, hearing from one of the biggest names in OCD treatment in the UK and in the world, Professor Naomi Feinberg. Uh, she's gonna be presenting the findings of a report into managing OCD in these challenging times. And then, uh, this is the honored bit, I'm really honored to be able to speak to her afterwards live. So we're gonna have a Q and A. And your bit, your role is to get your questions in. So while we're having the presentation from Naomi, make sure you uh, send the questions in. I'm gonna try and ask as many of them as I can. And of course we have lots of questions uh, during these tricky times of COVID. So get the questions in. Uh, if you don't send any, they'll be my questions and they'll be rubbish. So make sure you send questions in. I'll try and put them to Naomi in a Q and A um, after about the 20 minutes or so uh, presentation. First low, let's hear from Naomi now. Hello, my name is Naomi Feinberg. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Hertfordshire and a consultant psychiatrist at Hertfordshire Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust. I'm also secretary of the ICOX and it gives me great pleasure to deliver this presentation on the consensus guidance for managing OCD under COVID-19 as developed by the ICOX and the Obsessive Compulsive Research Network of the European College of neuropsychopharmacology. In order to understand the guidance, it's important to understand the context in which it was written. It was published in April 2020 as the epidemic was reaching its height uh, and it was produced speedily uh, in response to growing calls from patients, uh, many of them with the past history of contamination related OCD, who are finding that COVID-19 was all that they could possibly think about and that their symptoms had become very much worse under the pandemic restrictions. And also into response to calls from clinicians who were bemused as to what the best uh, approach to treating OCD could be under these conditions uh, that included uh, hand washing precautions and physical distancing, including uh, resulting in uh, social isolation. So in this emerging and confusing crisis situation, our aim was to deliver succinct, pragmatic guidance. In fact, the published document is only two and a half pages long. Uh, at the earliest opportunity 
to clinicians for managing what was emerging as a very complex challenge. Our methods involved setting up a working group of clinical experts from the ICOX and the OCRN, and we reached consensus over these guidelines via a series of meetings and iterative revisions of the guideline. Our working group had a balanced representation of genders, including clinicians treating child, adolescent and adult patients, with additional contributions from individuals with lived experience of the disorder and early career scientists. It's important also to consider the limitations of the guidance, as the advice is largely based on empirical evidence, um, as many of us had, had little experience of providing OCD treatment under such conditions. Uh, and the advice is largely based on clinical experience gained by the uh, experts from working in specialised OCD treatment services before and during the pandemic. This is necessarily a whistle-stop tour through the guidelines, so uh, I'd like you to note this is the publication of the full guideline. Uh, it's fully open access in the journal Comprehensive Psych Psychiatry for those of you who'd like to read it in more detail. The first phase of the guideline deals with some general guidance about managing patients suspected to have OCD. And our first piece of advice is to offer compassionate, calming, a compassionate and calming approach, paying attention to the fact that um, for some patients with OCD, it will be very difficult for them to actually adhere to the government guidelines um, in terms of physical distancing or keeping themselves at home, especially if, for example, in some parts of the world, they may not have access to running water in their home or they may simply, for economic reasons, have to go out of the home to work. We recommended the use of telemedicine where practical to avoid the unnecessary risk of face-to-face -face contact. And we encouraged a careful history taking, uh, focusing on diagnosis, ensuring the diagnosis of OCD was accurate, but also paying attention to other obsessive compulsive and related disorders uh, with particular reference reference to hypochondriasis, which we thought may be exaggerated under the pandemic, but also particular attention to uh, comorbidities, including depression or anxiety, that might make it more difficult for patients to cope uh, and increase risk of, of suicidal tendencies. We thought attention to insight would be very important and also a clear understanding of the focus of OCD concern as different treatment strategies may be needed for those with or without contamination related obsessions and compulsions. We recommended a very thorough assessment of suicide risk, not only because OCD is now recognised to have a substantial risk of suicide or behaviour associated with it, but also the particular contingencies associated with the COVID pandemic uh, that might increase the risk, such as a sudden exacerbation of OCD as a result of the pandemic, or in the case of those people who were socially isolated as a result of physical distancing, fe feeling unsupported, or those who may have suddenly been bereaved. We recommended providing balanced psychoeducation about the known risks and impacts of COVID-19 on physical and mental health and the necessary precautions without exaggerating these precautions. And we encouraged uh, an introduction of, of general stress management techniques uh, for our patients, uh, including uh, introducing them to mindfulness, uh, recommending exercise and keeping a structure to their day and a timetable to their week uh, to help them feel distracted and able to manage stress. We recommended inquiring specifically about the use of the internet and news consumption, uh, as this may increase rather than decrease anxiety, and recommended an upper limit of around an hour a day to avoid uh, exaggerating uh, COVID-related concerns.
If following uh, your initial assessment, OCD, and its treatment turns out to be the main issue, then our, recommend, our guidance focused on these five key domains, reviewing the medication status, reviewing and risk assessing the CBT plan, social and occupational care, uh, attention to special groups, and carer support. And in the following slides, I'll review these planks of our, our guidance uh, one by one. So first, review medication status. Now, given the fact that medication and CBT probably have roughly equivalent efficacy, evidence of efficacy, um, and the fact that there may be particular difficulties um, providing adequate CBT for patients with contamination related OCD, we decided to recommend pharmacotherapy as the usual first option for adults and children with OCD who have specifically contamination washing or cleaning symptoms during the COVID pandemic. In terms of the type of medication, this follows the standard evidence-based guidance to use an SSRI as preference uh, for most cases, or if responsive, another SSRI or clomipramine, uh, being aware of the need for ECG in particular patient groups, and noting the United States FDA black box and equivalent warnings regarding the possibility of increased risk in young people and other vulnerable patient groups associated with SSRI, in particular activation uh, effects and increased suicidal behavior. We therefore recommended strongly that Clinicians should check carefully for adverse effects and be available for any concerns related to activation or newly emergent or increased suicidal ideation, which in the young could be mitigated by starting treatment at a lower dose and titrating slower and more gradually. We recommended reviewing the dosage and if it was suboptimal to consider increasing it, paying attention to any contraindications and side effects. And looking carefully for evidence of SSRI resistance, in which case consideration of a low dose of adjunctive antipsychotic, particularly if a tick was present, would be appropriate. Importantly, we recommended uh, inquiring about adherence. The supplies of medication may be difficult to access, uh, and we thought it would be important to um, ensure that patients are taking their medication uh, regularly, and, and the use of pill boxes uh, was recommended for those who are having difficulty uh, remembering to take it properly. Uh, with regard to CBT, we thought the following questions needed to be carefully addressed uh, and discussed with the patient. Um, the first question is, would the CBT plan be feasible in the pandemic situation? Uh, does it fit with the government safety guidance? Are psychotherapy services available? As in many jurisdictions, psychotherapists have been redeployed to other areas of psychology. Uh, the next knotty question of whether uh, it would be possible to easily disentangle OCD related cleaning and checking compulsions from rational COVID-19 related safety behaviours so that the clinician could devise robust ERP strategies that are coherent. The next question would be one to risk assess the delivery of CBT by asking whether the patient might be confused by the exposure exercises, particularly during the early stages of CBT when they're just learning how to do it, or if they're practicing exposure on their own at home and possibly exposing them to increased infection risk. And we thought this was especially true for children whose knowledge base and judgment would not yet be fully matured. So having considered these issues with the patient and, and in the case of young people with their uh, parents or carers, uh, we thought it was important to tailor the CBT to the CDC guidance. And that would mean 
rather than ceasing hand washing completely, tailoring hand washing to the recommended 20 seconds, simply with soap and water. For those patients, that subgroup of patients with OCD who have predominant contamination fears and cleaning or washing compulsions that would be the focus of the ERP, we recommended sensibly adapting the in vivo ERP and considering whether it may need actually to be paused for the duration of the pandemic. Instead, we recommended therapists may consider supporting their patients, aiming at preventing deterioration, such as by encouraging them to restrain the compulsions as far as possible, rather than giving them active in vivo exposure. They should also concentrate on behavioural activation and activity scheduling, which are important elements of CBT. On the other hand, clinicians with special expertise, such as those working at specialist OCD centres, may consider for contamination related OCD other less evidence based forms of CBT, such as imaginal exposure or danger ideation reduction therapy, on the clear understanding that these are less well evidence based treatments. Moving on to the other larger, perhaps, group of patients whose OCD is not contamination related, we thought that ERP could be continued, um, such as uh, addressing the urges to check, etc. But the mental state should be carefully monitored as physical distancing and ERP can increase distress, anxiety and depression and put patients at increased risk. Um, and we're particularly concerned not to increase the risk of suicidality. We recommended maintaining a calm approach and reducing the risk of depression using supportive techniques, assessing avoidance and accommodation to determine whether it was proportional or excessive and trying to address it carefully to prevent backsliding. Also, we thought it was most important to regularly check any high risk obsessive compulsive behaviours such as washing in bleach or very hot water and to be vigilant for those with extreme doubt about contamination who may, for example, throw everything in their home away or have little or no food in the refrigerator uh, to make sure that they were safe. So. In sum, this guidance marks a change in practice for many clinicians treating OCD with CBT. The benefits and risks need to be balanced up and clear messages that take public health into account need to be given at this time of heightened risk of infection to avoid confusion. This means that temporarily modifying or pausing in vivo CBT with ERP for contamination related OCD, which is undoubtedly an effective form of treatment often preferred by patients in normal times, uh, represents a difficult but perhaps necessary decision to consider. On the other hand, many forms of CBT can be continued with modifications for safety as needed. Moving on then to social and occupational care, we thought it was very important to establish uh, a daily routine targeting circadian rhythm disrupt disruption and supporting activity scheduling with regular physical activity, making sure people are active up in the light in the mornings, managing any sleep disturbance, which would have a negative impact on mood. Again, reminding them to keep their, the amount of time they spend listening to news about COVID to a minimum, um, addressing grief uh, or loss of control in a supportive way and recommending hedonic and enjoyable activities as positive distractions. Helping isolated patients to overcome loneliness, for example, by supporting them in digital communication and, and encouraging various forms of aerobic exercise such as running, walking outside where that was possible or if people are restricted to their home 
um, helping them access the various online exercise channels that had um, become prolific under the pandemic. For those special groups such as those um, who are in receipt of deep brain stimulation, we thought special care was needed. Uh, for those patients who are waiting for electrodes to be implanted, we recommended that was postponed until uh, the height of the pandemic had passed. For those with electrodes already implanted, um, we understood that patients might experience an exacerbation of their OCD uh, uh, simply under the COVID pandemic. But at the same time, clinicians needed to be vigilant uh, for batteries running down, as it's a well-known uh, effect of uh, batteries stopping working that patients' OCD may become worse. And were that to be the case, a careful um, risk-benefit analysis would need to be taken, need to take place in consultation with the parents uh, so that a decision could be made as to whether they should come to hospital for their batteries either to be checked or even to be replaced, which may in some cases require a surgical operation. Care and support is extremely important in this time of crisis. It's particularly relevant as carers are themselves at increased risk of stress-related disorders, uh, especially if their loved one's symptoms of OCD uh, are worsening under the pandemic. And the uh, family members probably at most risk are the parents of young children with OCD who are likely to require even more coaching and support than before as relationships are impacted in unpredictable ways by families spending so much time together under lockdown. We should consider that parents are burdened differently under the pandemic, especially those who are single parents, those who have little living space, and particularly if children's accommodation is being resisted and they become irritable or even aggressive. We recommended maintaining social contact with others in the environment, using the phone or the internet for distraction. We recommended formulating rules for dealing with possible conflicts or tantrums in advance, uh, and encouragement for families to focus on hedonic and enjoyable activities uh, with their children, um, and not just rule-bound uh, or um, Du um, dutiful or COVID related conversations. Finally, uh, we thought that staying hopeful and together was really important for families with parents uh, demonstrating a positive role model for their children and that this increased family togetherness while uh, pr pr producing various challenges could also uh, represent a silver lining uh, for families in the pandemic and afterward. In conclusion, uh, under COVID-19, we believe stringent efforts should be made to provide effective care for individuals with OCD. The best available treatments for most patients will include evidence-based pharmacotherapy and modifying or pausing CBT in conjunction with enhanced supportive therapies, including social and occupational care. Understanding the impact of the pandemic on the expression of OCD in affected patients and on the development of new cases of OCD will in the future provide important insights into the environmental determinants of the disorder. And so as a, a final recommendation, we encouraged research active groups to investigate actively the impact of pandemic related conditions on health outcomes among their patients, as well as the expected rise in incidence of new cases of OCD amongst the public once the pandemic is over.
Thank you very much indeed, Professor Naomi Feinberg. Um, some fascinating uh, points came from the report, many that I will be uh, taking on board with my son who has OCD, and I'm sure many of you uh, found those uh, findings very really interesting. Now, before we bring Naomi in, I just want to encourage you, please do get your questions in. I'm gonna try and get as many of them to Naomi as possible. We've already got a few coming in at the moment. That's first, get to Naomi, that's uh, bring her in. Hello, lovely to see you, Naomi. Good afternoon. Well, here in the UK, <laughs> it's the afternoon. Lovely it to see you. Is. Well, well, I know we've got um, some viewers. We normally have viewers from Australia and the USA and right across Europe. So uh, whatever time it is, uh, good afternoon, good morning. You know, you're welcome. And it's really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for uh, presenting those findings, Naomi. Uh, I'm going to get straight to the questions because we've got quite a few coming on, uh, coming in. Nick Zero has said, uh, how has Professor Feinberg's thinking about treating OCD during the pandemic evolved since the ICOC statement last April? So, of course, you did that report uh, last April when COVID in the UK in particular was uh, first really affecting us. And then Nick goes on. I'm going to actually put that up. I think I can show that there. Uh, and Nick goes on to say, I'm guessing clinicians have more experience now. So have you found that your your view on the way COVID is affecting OCD has changed in the past nine months? Well, what a great question, because when, as, as I said in the outset, when, when we devised these guidelines, this really was terra incognita. It was unknown territory. We weren't entirely sure what the right thing to do would be. I think what I would simply say is that it has reinforced and strengthened our guidance, the, the experience of the last few months, in particular the emphasis on supporting families and the more general um, supportive techniques that we think are very important for people with OCD to protect against depression and, and reduce stress. So the more generic techniques such as mindfulness, making sure there's a balanced day, timetable of activities during the day. These seem to have been really important elements of the care plan that up until the pandemic, we didn't think so much about, but have brought into stark relief. But there's nothing in the guidance that I would say needed to be changed based on the experience of the last 12 months. Yeah, um, another message coming in. Uh, this is K Anonymous. So does that mean they're anonymous or they're K? I'm not sure. But anyway, I think they, they know who they are. Uh, let me put that up here now. I have severe OCD. I am so isolated now. Uh, my compulsions have increased. Uh, and that's a story that lots of people um, will, will empathise with. I'm receiving a DBT for another diagnosis. My care team say that DBT helps with OCD too. I don't feel I'm getting the right care. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of not sure exactly what the, the question is in there, but that is going to be a story that many people will say they're having to isolate uh, and the OCD has got worse, the compulsions have got worse. Uh, I mean, you you went through many things in, in the report, but just in a nutshell, what would you say to um, that person? Um, what sort of things can they be looking out for to do to improve uh, and to try and beat those compulsions? Absolutely. So the first thing to say that is that under pandemic conditions, it can be very difficult to obtain CBT for your OCD for all sorts of reasons. It may be that there are no psychotherapists available because they're all on the front line dealing with other things. It may be that the OCD that you've got is not going to be suitable for ERP, which is the standard treatment of uh, standard psychological treatment of OCD, because inevitably it involves exposure to risk and it's a treatment that's devised not in a pandemic because the risk is minimal in exposure therapy in normal times but when you're living in a pandemic the risk is real so it's very hard to give the standard therapies that involve going outside dirtying yourself coming home and not washing when there is a real risk of infection with COVID. So the first thing to say is we have to acknowledge that that limb of the treatment for some people is just not going to be practically available. It may be, for if you have other kinds of OCD, you may be able to have your exposure response prevention, but assuming it's contamination related, it may not be available. But that doesn't mean to say there aren't other treatments that are entirely available and suitable. So the first thing is, as I said, 
making sure you're on your right, the right medication. If you've got bad OCD, you should consider being on an SSRI. Uh, failing that, clomipramine, the older, older treatments. Uh, there are other forms of medication if those in themselves are not that effective, but the majority of people do well on them. And, you know, in, in other times, it would be a matter of choice. People would say, well, I'd rather have CBT or I'd rather have medication. And both were readily available. But under the pandemic, you know, the choice is much more limited. So I would really reinforce the importance of the medication because in general terms, my experience is that's readily available. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was hard to see a GP. Some people were running out of tablets. But we seem to, certainly in the UK, we've resolved all those problems. Doesn't seem to be any difficulty getting the medication. It works exactly the same as it would do under pan, uh, before the pandemic. So I'd focus on that. Uh, and then I'd think about these other supportive forms of treatment. Um, so it's about uh, behavioural activation and activity scheduling is all about making sure that you have enough activities going on during the day. Easily said than more easily said than done, as I, I realise, because we're all stuck here. You can see I'm at home. We're all we're all stuck in under lockdown, and some of us have lost our jobs. Some of them have had to completely take time out or be furloughed. It's really important. OCD spreads to feel the time, the vacuum available to it. So make sure you're keeping yourself busy and active. And then applying other techniques that are generally helpful for managing stress and distress, such as mindfulness, such as not catastrophizing. Your OCD may be bad now, but when the pandemic is over, we'll get back on track and get back into the swing of treatments again. So I don't see this as a permanent change, but it's helping people manage over this period. Um, not although we can't necessarily give you the exposure therapy that involves actively dirtying yourself we can give you helpful guidance to uh, restrain your behaviors and to rein them in to a, a safe minimum and in that respect it's been very helpful to have the nhs guidance on hand washing on the internet because we often ask patients to just watch that in the UK, we sing happy birthday twice as we wash our hands. That takes us to 20 seconds and that's it. Soap and water, that's all you need. 20 seconds, finished, and do no more. And that's the sort of sensible, pragmatic guidance that we can be providing or, or that people can do for themselves. Um, so, so, so where's... where's so, just to say, so it's where someone before who had a contamination, had contamination OCD, would be told, don't wash your hands. Now we're saying, uh, I mean, of course, you can't be helping people individually because you don't know the individual cases, but the sort of general broad advice would be, you, you need to wash your hands for 20 seconds, which would be, say, singing happy birthday uh, twice, which would be 20 seconds, and then stop. So you're just moving the line from not at all to 20 seconds because COVID is a real risk. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And we'd we'd very much encourage people themselves. I know when you have OCD, it's very hard to get a balanced approach, but we'd encourage people themselves to be kind to themselves, to to not, you know, to not beat yourself up if you find yourself overdoing it, but try your best to rein it in to that practical guidance, the safe guidance, 20 seconds and then stop. If you fail and you run over, it's not the end of the world, but next time, try and stop. Okay, well, thanks for that, Kay Anonymous. Um, so, so, Naomi, we talked about Australia, uh, viewers in uh, America and in Europe, and of course, right across the UK. Uh, we have a, a viewer in India. So this is uh, Atman Raina. I'm a doctor from India and have been suffering from OCD for the past one and a half years. Um, and then goes on to say, uh, daily, I have to deal with patients and have to be near them for certain procedures, which makes my OCD more tough on me. It, it would be great if I could get some advice from you all about how to deal with it. Uh, and then he, he goes on or she goes on to say, um, I always uh, follow the exposure and response thing, but it's tough to deal with these things every day. So we had Kate Anonymous, who is finding that they're, they're actually not you know, meeting people and not getting out. Uh, and then we've got other people who are really exposed to things that are really triggering them. What would your advice be? 
I think in, this is an exactly the kind of situation where, again, those generic supportive techniques are really important. Make sure you're in contact with loved ones, with friends, um, keeping yourself active. Don't spend, if you're busy at work as a, do as, as a doctor or in, or in a, a profession or, or in, in, at work where you're putting yourself out there and at some risk, be aware of the fact that you need to take some care of yourself. So make sure that you stay in touch with friends and family, have pleasant conversations, engage in hobbies, engage in enjoyable, make time to engage in enjoyable activities that might help distract you just even if it's for five minutes. Because while being out there is actually good for your OCD, it will be very stressful and we want to make sure that people's mood stays high because that's a risk for people who are under chronic stress of exposing yourself all the time, which is good for your OCD because you're not avoiding, you're facing up to the situations, but it can be stressful. So make sure that you have plenty of, of support, peer support and family support and engage in pleasurable activities. Uh, lots of people there's actually a bit of a conversation going on in in, in the um in the messages between people so it's great that you're giving advice to other people uh, j i just quickly want to go back to k anonymous i don't want to um uh, focus on you too much it's so hard i've been so worried about contaminating others for years the media stress is taking responsibility for others it is um it, it is important but it is hard when you already are hyper responsible and i, I just want to bring that in with another point that you mentioned uh, which is Distractions, it's great to have distractions. It's great to have things. I mean, you I suppose you shouldn't base your whole um, uh, uh, way of avoiding OCD on distractions, but distractions are helpful, whoever you are and whatever you're, you're facing. But when you put the internet on and you watch the news, all you're hearing as Kay Anonymous says is that you're taking responsibility for others. And if you get it wrong, you may actually harm them. It's difficult, isn't it? Because many of the distractions we have, which is the internet, is full of stuff that is full of fear. It's full of fear and there's a lot of blame around. If I, I, I hear the news from the perspective of someone dealing with people with OCD all the time who are exquisitely sensitive to the finger pointing at them. They have an internal finger pointing at them, telling them they're to blame and responsible for everything. They don't need to be told from the news that you know they're risking everybody else's health as well if they don't do things absolutely 100% perfectly. And, and all the naming and shaming and so on all results in an atmosphere of, of, of fear and distrust and blame, which is really not helpful for people with OCD. So it was for that reason that we were really quite keen to stipulate people not spending too long. We can't change the news, <laughs> but what we can do is change our exposure to it. So at the time the guidance was written, it was interesting, you know, things were developing so quickly. We thought it was really important that people stayed abreast of the news for their own safety. But now we're more used to, you know, we, we know what we're dealing with more. We may be even more stringent and say, really limit the amount of time you spend looking online or reading, listening to the news about COVID related information, because it's it's only going to make you more stressed. Um, so try and keep a handle on that. And, and as I said, be a bit more sympathetic to yourself and uh, sympathetic to others as well. We are all just doing the best in an impossible situation. And as we say in the clinic, and we'd like those of you with OCD to try and practice, good enough is good enough. We're all just doing as best we can, and that's all we can expect of people. Yeah. Okay, so let me bring in this question. Uh, Pernil Witt uh, Kirkgaard, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Pernil. Uh, um, is there a special way to treat sensor sensory motor OCD? Um, I'm going to have to throw over to you there. I don't know what type of OCD that is. Is that, um, can you explain what that is? I don't know what sensory motor <laughs> OCD is either. So okay. if, if, the, if uh, the person could just give us a bit more detail of yeah. what his symptoms are, I'd be more than happy. There are various phrases that, you know, people use colloquially. Um, I don't think there's, uh, my guess is there's no special treatment for this that's different from ordinary OCD. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, Pernil, get, get, give us some more details and we'll see if we can get across that. 
Um, the Hatter said, I haven't seen my grandparents since the beginning of all of this. Uh, don't want to take risks. Now, I, I just want to tie that in with something you said earlier and, you know, with being blamed for so many things. That se seems to be the messaging. It's sort of, you should not see your grandparents. Um, and if you do, you're going to harm them. It's, it's sort of the blame. And one of the things I learned about OCD, my son, as you know, has OCD. Um, and he has sort of, you know, his OCD is pure, so it's violent and sexual thoughts. And one of the things I learned that was that, that actually, and I, I remember feeling feeling really relieved when a clinician told me this, that the person with OCD, the thoughts they have, the fear they have that they're going to do something bad, they are the least likely person to do that. And it, re, it sort of really changed things. And I said, gosh, yeah, actually, he's really sensitive. He would never do any of those things. And, and in a way, that's that ties in with the OCD, which is convincing him that he's a bad person, that he could do those things. And, you know, just... It strangely sort of chime that in with the hatter what the hatter says i haven't seen my grandparents i'm not encouraging you to see your grandparents but i wonder whether there's this thing when you have ocd that blame that is that comes out the message is i feel blame and i don't have ocd but if i had ocd it would be times about 100 and that's a big burden isn't it it's a huge burden but sean you're spot on because that's a message that again we try and impart in our dealings with people with ocd is that one thing you can say to somebody with OCD is you are least likely because you are an expert in taking care of whatever it is that you're doing, whatever your OCD involves. You are the one who is you are the most practiced at doing it. You're an expert at hand washing. You're an expert at avoiding touching things and contamination and so on. You are the least of all the members of your family, assuming the others haven't got OCD, you are the least likely to cause harm and to be responsible for some terrible damaging cat catastrophe than anybody else. So please remember that, that you are the safest person. And people can take heart from that and, and, and can acknowledge that, that actually because they're so careful, they aren't as dangerous, although they worry they're very dangerous, they actually know in their heart of hearts that they are very, very careful. Mm. Uh, and uh, the Hatter has responded, I have purely obsessional OCD too. I can relate to your son on many levels. And uh, um, yeah, just, I just want to emphasize what Naomi said. If you are fearing something and you have OCD, you are the least likely person to do that. So you know, please just try and detangle um, what you, that, that strong OCD thought that's there and say, actually, that's not me. Uh, and it, it, I know it's difficult in these times. So Pernell, uh, Naomi, we have some more details. Pernell has got back uh, in touch and said, so, Sensory motor OCD, also known as uh, somatically focused OCD, refers to, in, to cases in which people become hyper aware of their bodily sensations, such as their breathing, swallowing, or heartbeat. Now, I don't, I don't know if there's something we, you know, maybe we're going into too much detail here, but is, if that's getting stronger, and I assume that's why Pernell's getting in touch, if that's getting stronger uh, during lockdown, and may, maybe Pernell isn't having access to treatment, maybe medication, um, is is there any advice you can give? Um, maybe maybe same, it's... well, the same principles would would apply. It sounds like Pernell's got a very good understanding that he's hypersensitive. He's he's sensitized to noting noticing these things and then acting upon the noticing. So the treatment is all about allowing yourself to notice them, but trying not to overreact to just experience them, just the same as an obsessional thought allow the experience to happen but don't overreact it's what how you react to it so instead of catastrophizing having noticed it allow the sensation to be experienced as oh yes it's my sensory motor ocd i'm sensitized to my heartbeat i'm not going to panic over this it's just what i do carry on now of course if you're not if, if you haven't got anything to carry on with if you're living in a vacuum just sitting there listening to your heart or feeling your pulse or feeling whatever of course it's very hard to carry on which is why we think activity scheduling is so important to have this structured timetable so that when we say carry on there is something to be doing that can distract you uh, and just to give a, a nod to ash curry he, he's uh, filled us in on what what it actually is uh, so that's great it's really good we're, we're all playing in, in the same team here aren't we helping each other out so I just, uh, I, I wanna focus on something you uh, mentioned and that is um, focusing on carers because um, my experience as a parent of a, a child with OCD is that, and I, I've met lots of families in exactly the same boat, when your child 
goes down that sort of mental health plug hole struggling they pull everybody else in the family down that plug hole as well and it, and, and it affects everybody around them so during this time we've talked about people who are struggling with ocd what about carers and particularly parents you there was one thing you said in there so i think you mentioned have a plan so that when your child is having a difficult moment you sort of know what you're doing is, is that what you said i couldn't quite it is what I said. Of course, it's another of these easier said than done statements. <laughs> <laughs> Having been a parent myself, or still being a parent myself, uh, I know what it's like. But it, it I mean, it, it's pretty predictable with OCD, the sorts of pinch points that are going to uh, affect you um, when you're, you know, you, you know the sorts of things that are going to challenge your child. So having some kind of agreed negotiated strategy both the parent, if, if you're lucky to be in a family with two parents, both parents together, be really helpful that you negotiate with the child how you're going to respond. You know, OCD is a bully. It bullies the individual, but it bullies the whole family as well. So having really clear, um, I wouldn't say rules, but, but principles, because rules become quite punishing, but principles of how you're going to approach certain situations. So, for example, if the child uh, won't touch certain things and wants you to do it for them or wants you to check for them, and you've, you know, you're taking the principle that if the child wants to check, they can check, but you're not going to do it for them, but you'll be supportive of them. Uh, and the child gets very upset and shouts and screams because the family are not accommodating and doing it for them. Having some kind of plan for how to manage that, maybe a distraction technique or something or some calm explanation if they realise it's the OCD, but actually the principles of the care are this. Um, usually, of course, when we're not in lockdown, you can open the door and you can go outside and have a walk and clear your head. It's much harder to do that under lockdown. So we do understand, but maybe having designated areas in the house, if you can, that are calm areas that people can go and just calm down when the OCD is really bad or the frustration of the OCD is really bad can be helpful. And again, a plan of regular hedonic, so pleasurable activities. Uh, that can be engaged in parents with children. So they're not constantly talking about, you know, their interactions are not always around OCD, but around other things that have nothing to do with OCD uh, can be helpful. And of course, with us, with the parents all being at home, that does give us opportunities that we just didn't have before. So th there are some silver linings uh, to OCD that I think will pay dividends when, when the pandemic is over. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I, I think as a parent, you, you just don't beat yourself up. It's very easy to sort of blame yourself or oh, this, I should have done that. You know, if you are struggling yourself with your mental health because of the situation, you're going to be no good for your child. And that's one thing I, I learned. Um, Guy, so Guy Robertson has, has got in touch. This is quite a long one. There's a couple of bits to this um, question. On the flip side to the responsibility topic, the problem can be others in the household not living up to the same standards without resorting to micromanaging or checking. How can this be dealt with? And he goes on to give an example. Um, for example, my OCD tells me to ensure my parents are washing their hands correctly when necessary. Not doing so then encourages me to avoid touching things they have touched. It's a no-win situation. So, so what we've got is a household there where Guy um, has OCD. It's, it sounds like contamination OCD. He is um he's following the rules that we are all told to follow uh his parents aren't or other people in his family aren't and that then triggers his ocd but really they should be doing they should be responsible you know they should be following the rules washing their hands when they go to the shops come back wash their hands all those sorts of things and they're not now he he's saying without wanting to micromanage he can't make his parents do something no. but really their actions are sort of triggering his ocd what can he do well Everyone takes responsibility. He's living in the house with them. They all take responsibility. You won't be able to chair, you know, having a conflict over it is un unlikely to help. They will be doing the best they can and their best doesn't meet his standard. Everyone will have a different standard. We know that people with OCD very often are rather perfectionist, so they may have a higher standard than other people. That will inevitably lead to conflict. But I think it's really important for individuals 
to manage their own behavior and not try and impose their behavior on other people. So once you've explained to your parents, look, I'd really rather you follow the standard. In the end, it's up to them. And I think having arguments with them over it isn't, isn't really going to work. It just might mean that you will have to, you will decide in yourself, I, I imagine if you have OCD, to be more careful. Um, but I think avoiding conflict is really important. And also reflecting on whether your standards, whether you are being excessive, whether they have done, they may not have done it perfectly to your liking, but they may have done it well enough. It, it may be acceptable. Well, well just in general, because guys actually got back in touch and I sort of, I think I probably interpreted it uh, wrong. I've just to go back to his last uh, question. He said, my OCD tells me to ensure my parents um, are washing their hands. And, and I think the clue is in his OCD tells him. So then he's gone on to say, sorry, I'd like to stress that I know this is my OCD talking and not them not following the rules. So I, I'm sorry, guy, I blamed your parents. If they're watching, I apologize. Your parents are doing a great job, but his OCD is telling him. So yeah. that changes things so that, a bit, doesn't it? He, well, that's yeah. exactly, that, that, that fits more with my experience is that, that the person with OCD is so meticulous that they have such rigid standards that they're having to double check and micromanage. And I think you should try your best to opt out of that. And it's their responsibility to wash their hands. It's your responsibility to do yours. And that's all that anyone can do. That's the best we can do in this situation. And it will feel uncomfortable, but feeling uncomfortable about it tells you that you're facing up and I sound this sounds a very challenging piece of advice you have to be very stoical to treat yourself of your own OCD using behavioral principles but the principles are that if you're feeling uncomfortable because it doesn't feel quite right that tells you you're on the right track it means that you're not giving in to the OCD. It won't feel comfortable. It will feel very uncomfortable because that's what OCD is. It's alarm bells are ringing. Oh, it's not right. But you're doing the right thing by not interfering and just steering the safe but not excessive obsessional track of behavior. I mean, that's that's the ERP um, right in front of him, isn't it? Guy is living in, in a house, which I suppose anyone with OCD is with, with the ERP, but his parents... He, the OCD is telling him his parents haven't washed his hand, their hands, and that's the ERP, isn't it? He needs to sort of live with that and and go with it. with it. And I, I think so, I get the impression from guys' messages he knows that, but he it, it's so hard when you've got OCD and the voice is so strong in your head, isn't it? It's very very difficult. So that's why I think support and talking to people, so people realise. So on the one hand, you're doing it, so you are walking the walk, but on the other hand it's important that people recognize the stress that that uh, produces for you, the difficulties that you have, that you then factor in times of the day where you can relax and that your family understands as well. So that, you know, you're making this huge effort, but it needs to be acknowledged and you need to have time out and rewarding time. I suppose the other thing to say is we can get out of the house. People are, people with OCD have difficulty leaving, of course, because of all the rituals involved of leaving the house. But going out, having some fresh air, we really emphasised, you know, being out in the fresh air away from people. So then you'd be on your own away from your family. Just time for the whole thing to settle down could be really important. Yeah. Okay. So, Guy, and that's that's finished with Guy, but he says many thanks. So, um, as a happy customer, um, let's get back to Pernell as well. Just a just a bit of feedback. Thank you for answering my question. Um, this is about the sensory motor OCD. I'm trying to activate myself under lockdown, but isn't um, but isn't it a compulsion if we are trying to make ourselves busy to escape from our OCD? Is that a compulsion or is that a distraction? And not all distractions are bad. I, I, I don't know. What's yes, I mean, there is a worry, of course, that people who are habitual and compulsive will make their distractions compulsive and they're just, you know, they're just avoiding the exposure. I think we have to make allowances for ourselves under the pandemic. You know, we can't do behaviour therapy the way we'd like to do. It's really important that you have plenty of distraction there. We're just going to try and contain the OCD for this period. And when the pandemic is over, we can look at more rigorous approaches. So don't feel too bad about it. I haven't yet seen a patient with OCD who is doing too many other things that makes me worry that they've become compulsive. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. I think it's important to keep yourself really as active as you can during wake, just but during waking hours. 
So I, I, I don't know if you're into cricket, uh, Naomi, but I suppose this is a bit like um, you're, you're batting and you, there's a particularly hostile period of bowling and you just need to play the forward defence through lockdown. You just need to get through it. And then when <laughs> lockdown's finished, you're going to hit it out of the park. You're going to get a six. You're going to win the match. But you, you might not win the match during lockdown. But but it, it's all, you know, you're going to be out of the tunnel soon. Let's get to Kev1189. Um, what advice do you have for mental compulsions and rumination that are so powerful that lock you down physically, this is, until the distress passes or you're able to get the mental ritual thought right? So um, basically being locked down. Uh, and I, I, am, I sort of understand that because my son uh, had that where he just couldn't do things. And, and, the, and I was really surprised because this is a mental illness that was as debilitating as a physical disability. And, and I just had no idea that could be possible. And I know now it is. And so I, I, I feel for Kev. And uh, what would you say? How, how can you beat that? So this half of the population with OCD, I say half, I mean, it isn't exactly half, but let's say roughly half, roughly half of the population of, o of people with OCD are doing rituals in order to avoid something bad happening. So we've been talking a lot about not causing contamination and so on. Another half of the population with OCD are doing compulsive rituals in order for it to feel just right. But no real, no real um, concern or, or excessive concern about the consequences. It's just got to feel right. The thought has to be right in my head. And I think this is what Kevin is, Kev is, is describing here. And until it feels right, you're paralyzed, you're stuck. There's very little you can do. So the treatment, this is a treatment that, that can be done under COVID. We don't have to stop doing it. The, the psychological treatment, and, and you're not going to like what I say because exposure response prevention invokes distress. But the treatment involves practicing, experiencing things, not feeling right. So that's what the exposure involves. You have to make mistakes. You have to think wrong thoughts. You have to learn to tolerate them and realize not that nothing terrible happens. In effect, nothing terrible does happen. But that's not necessarily the point of it. The point is that you can tolerate things not feeling right and you can deal with that distress without it destroying you and without you you can carry on working holding that unpleasant feeling and it shouldn't paralyze you and i think in the quest your question you know illustrates that nicely you know you should be able to have bad thoughts and still carry on muddle through anyway but you're absolutely stopped in your tracks so the sort of cbt that we would recommend would be a form of exposure response prevention that looks at getting you we, we in in the treatment we um ask you to prepare a hierarchy a list of situations that you have to expose yourself to that get more and more difficult and in your case uh, my guess is that this would be involve exposing yourself to thoughts and situations that feel wrong to allow you to tolerate wrong feelings and wrong thoughts and not be overly distressed by it. Now, it's not easy, but it's very, very achievable. The other thing to say is, you know, are you taking your medication for your OCD? Get your medication right. Are you on an SSRI? I, if not, you know, think about why not. Are you on a high dose of it? Because the highest dose is the most effective. Are you taking it regularly? If it hasn't affected improvement and it sounds like you're still struggling, have you changed it to a different one? Because that's what we would do first. If that doesn't work, we might try clomipramine. If that doesn't work, we might try an adjunctive antipsychotic in very low dose because it acts on a different chemical from the SSRI. And if that doesn't work, we should be referring you to, um, you know, a, an expert centre where they manage treatment resistant OCD. Because what you're describing is eminently treatable with the treatments that should be available under COVID. Um, that's brilliant. I, there are a few other questions. We're just not going to get a chance to get to them. So I, I'm sorry to the few people who we haven't managed to, to ask the, the questions of. Um, but that was that was a brilliant sum up of what Kev um, is going through and, and, and sort of the help that he'd get. And I, the reason I know it's great because I've scribbled it down because I'm thinking that sounds like I'm something I need to take on board with my son. This idea that you um, things that are just right, 
you they may you may still feel that anxiety but you need to be able to tolerate it to to live your life and i suppose that's a really good message for ocd that um i mean i was told and i think this is right my son will always have ocd and there will be difficult times in his life but he needs to learn to tolerate those feelings and get through them uh, i'd say uh, yeah it's brilliant advice i've written look i've literally written lots of notes naomi so i uh, selfishly I have pinched a lot of the, the points that you said. We, we're running out of time. We've got a sort of 30 or 40 seconds before um, the end of the hour. The hour has flown by, uh, and I'm really appreciative that you've been able to do this and, and take time out of your busy day now, because I guess you're very busy at the moment. Very busy. What we found though is it's not all been doom and gloom. I want to, I always like to finish on a positive note, but it's a realistic positive note. Uh, while some patients are struggling, uh, the great majority of people are doing really well under COVID. They have survived. They're finding strategies for managing it. And of course, with the uh, with the development of these vaccines that are now being rolled out, there's a great sense of hope amongst the OCD community. So I think if we just hang on, blue skies are, are coming and, and things will get very much better very soon. What a brilliant way to end it. Professor Naomi Feinberg, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all your questions. They've been brilliant and they've really helped shape. I, I had a list of questions and I haven't asked any of them, which is a good thing because my questions are rubbish compared to yours. So great. Thank you very much for everybody who's watching and sending your questions. And a big thank you to Professor Naomi Feinberg. Uh, and that's where we end the broadcast. Thank you very much. <laughs>